The spirituality of imperfection, abridged. Storytelling and the search for meaning by Ernest Kurtz and Catherine Ketchum. Read by Vincent Bagnall. The Introduction The Story of Spirituality Baseball teaches us, or has taught most of us, how to deal with failure. We learn at a very young age that failure is the norm in baseball, and precisely because we have failed, we hold in high regard those who fail less often, those who hit safely in one out of three chances, and become star players. I also find it fascinating that baseball, alone in sport, considers errors to be part of the game, part of its rigorous truth. Francis T. Vincent, Jr., Commissioner of Baseball. Baseball, as its commissioner points out, teaches that errors are a part of the game and perfection is an impossible goal because his thought fits as perfectly as possible the theme of the book. We offer this revision of Mr. Vincent's insight. Spirituality teaches us, or has taught most of us, how to deal with failure. We learn at a very young age that failure is the norm in life. Errors are part of the game, part of its rigorous truth. Discovering spirituality in the game of baseball is not so strange as it sounds. For literally thousands of years, sages and saints have explored the ordinary and everyday in the attempt to understand the extraordinary and divine. The ritual of the Japanese tea ceremony, simply carrying and serving tea, is a profound spiritual exercise. The posture of kneeling in prayer conveys acceptance and mindfulness. Standing up in a crowded room and saying, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic, calls forth the spiritual realities of humility, gratitude, tolerance, and forgiveness. Spirituality takes many forms and all spiritualities do not look on failure and imperfection in the same way. But through the centuries, a recurring spiritual theme has emerged, one that is more sensitive to earthly concerns than to heavenly hopes. This spirituality, the spirituality of imperfection, is thousands of years old, and yet it is timeless, eternal, and ongoing for it is concerned with what in the human being is irrevocable and immutable, the essential imperfection, the basic and inherent flaws of being human. The spirituality of imperfection tells the story of the ancient traditions of spirituality coming into contact with the modern world and its unique problems. In that collision between the old and the new, a spirituality many thousands of years old was both rediscovered and recreated. Who were the ancient architects of this spirituality which reflects Greek, Jewish, Christian, and Eastern influences? What significance do their insights have for modern times? How did it happen that a bunch of 20th century drunks found their experience verified by and verifying of ancient wisdom. What are the changes that the 12-step program brings about in the lives of so many and so varied inhabitants of the modern world? Why do alcoholics seem to need a spiritual program in order to stay sober? Why do so many people find a need for spirituality in their lives? The spirituality of imperfection examines these questions, looking beyond AA's 12 steps to the origins and significance of their inherent abiding message. Following the tradition that we explore, we will attempt to tell our story of spirituality, both the ancient tale and its modern-day detailing in Alcoholics Anonymous, through myths, parables, and especially stories. For once upon a time, people told stories in the midst of sorrow and in the presence of joy, both mourners and celebrants told stories, but especially in times of trouble when a miracle was needed and the limits of human ability were reached 
People turn to storytelling as a way of exploring the fundamental mysteries. Who are we? Why are we? How are we to live? The spirituality of imperfection is a spirituality of not having all the answers. For those who have come to expect an answer to every question, a solution to every problem, and an end to every beginning, such an approach may be disconcerting at first. As we travel around in the past, rummaging through the different traditions, pulling out a thought here, relating a story there, revealing a way of seeing the world from over there, the reader may experience a sense of dislocation and disorientation. But continue on, for this seemingly disjointed wandering is the way of imperfection. By the end of this journey, the jarring notes, spatial dissonances, and cultural cacophonies will blend together into a sort of symphony. A chorus of separate, distinct, and sometimes off-key voices harmonizing into a whole. Not perfect harmony, but harmony nonetheless. The Fragrance of a Rose Religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those who have been there. Ross V., a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. The disciples were absorbed in a discussion of Lao Tzu's dictum. Those who know do not say. Those who say do not know. When the master entered, they asked him what the words meant, and said the master, well, which of you knows the fragrance of a rose? All of them knew. Then he said, put it into words. All of them were silent. What is spirituality? Well, to have the answer is to have misunderstood the question. Truth, wisdom, goodness, beauty, the fragrance of a rose, all resemble spirituality in that they are intangible, ineffable realities. We may know them, but we can never grasp them with our hands or with our words. And these entities have neither color nor texture. They cannot be gauged in inches or ounces or degrees. They do not make a noise to be measured in decibels. They have no distinct feel as do silk, wood, or cement. They give no odor. They have no taste. They occupy no space. And yet they exist. They are. Love exists. Evil exists. Beauty exists. Spirituality exists. These are the realities that have always been recognized as defining human existence. We do not define them, they define us. When we attempt to define spirituality, we discover not its limits, but our own. Similarly, we cannot prove such realities. It is truer to say that they prove us, in the sense that it is against them that we measure our own human being, the act and the process by which we exist. Life is not what we have or even what we do, connected as they may be. We are what and how and who we are, and being is a real activity. Like love, spirituality is a way that we be. This way of being defies definition and delineation. We cannot tie it up in any way, package it, or enclose it. Elusive in the sense that it cannot be pinned down. Spirituality slips under and soars over efforts to capture it, to fence it in with words. Centuries of thought confirm that mere words can never induce the experience of spirituality. And when the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov asked him how to know whether a celebrated scholar whom they proposed to visit was a true Zadok, he answered, Ask him to advise you what to do to keep unholy thoughts from disturbing you in your prayers and studies. If he gives you advice, then you will know that he belongs to those who are of no account. 
Words, as is well known, are the great foes of reality, wrote Joseph Conrad. But when words fail, where can we turn? In order to understand spirituality, in order to live a spiritual life, we must first be able to imagine such a life, to form a mental picture, a re-presentation or representation of what it might look like and feel like. But to do that, to see and feel spirituality, we need a deeper level of language to help us fathom our experience. And so, as people have done throughout the ages, we turn to metaphors, images, and stories. Metaphors govern understanding by suggesting that an unknown and ineffable entity, life, can best be understood as an activity one knows something about. Pilgrimage, for example. While pilgrimage is perhaps the most frequently used metaphor for the spiritual life, a modern spiritual writer uses another ancient example, that of health. Spirituality is a lot like health. We all have health. We may have good health or poor health, but it's something we can't avoid having. The same is true of spirituality. Every human being is a spiritual being. The question is not whether we have spirituality, but whether the spirituality we have is a negative one that leads to isolation and self-destruction or one that is more positive and life-giving. Images, detailed portraits or panoramic pictures stored in the mind's memory drawers also have their role in moving our understanding toward the standing under, that is, experience, a term that conveys a kind of seeing that both thinks and feels. If we try to call forth spirituality in our imagination, do we envision a picture of some saint, Francis of Assisi, Albert Schweitzer, or Mother Teresa of Calcutta? Or perhaps a religious ceremony comes to mind, the echoes of ancient ritual in the Catholic Mass, the free-spirited enthusiasm of a revival meeting, the quiet serenity of a Quaker gathering. But still, something is missing for while such images may help bring the concept of spirituality into finer focus, they fall far short of capturing the harmony of seeing, thinking, and feeling that is spirituality. But stories, stories are the vehicle that moves metaphor and image into experience. And like metaphors and images, stories communicate what is generally invisible and ultimately inexpressible. In seeking to understand these realities through time, stories provide a perspective that touches on the divine, allowing us to see reality in full context as part of its larger whole. Stories invite a kind of vision that gives shape and form even to the invisible, making the images move, clothing the metaphors, throwing color into the shadows. Of all the devices available to us, stories are the surest way of touching the human spirit. Beyond the Ordinary What we call basic truths are simply the ones we discover after all the others. Albert Camus Concepts create idols. Only wonder comprehends anything. People kill one another over idols. Wonder makes us fall to our knees. St. Gregory of Nicaea. One day, Mohammed was offering morning prayer at the mosque, and among the people praying with the Prophet was an Arab aspirant. In reading the Quran, Mohammed recited the verse in which Pharaoh makes the claim, I am your true God. On hearing this, the aspirant was so filled with spontaneous anger that he broke the silence and shouted, The boastful son of a bitch! The prophet said nothing, but after prayer was over, the others began to scold the Arab. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? You have surely displeased God, because not only did you interrupt the holy silence of prayer, but you used filthy language in the presence of God's prophet. 
Well, the poor Arab trembled with fear until Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and said, God sends greetings to you and wishes you to get these people to stop scolding that simple Arab. Indeed, his spontaneous profanity moved my heart more than the holy prayers of the others. Spirituality points always beyond, beyond the ordinary, beyond possession, beyond the narrow confines of the self, and above all, beyond expectation because the spiritual is beyond our control. It is never exactly what we expect. The word spiritual originally meant what the most obvious synonyms of spirit, breath, wind signify, something that cannot be seen, but that we nevertheless experience. Although the wind is very powerful and you can feel its presence in and of itself, it cannot be seen. You know it's there by its effect on others. The great trees, the grasses, and waves on the sea bend with its force. If you're aware of your surroundings, you know it's there long before you feel it. So it is with the ineffable. In calling to mind a picture of the wind, an everyday reality that is beyond our visual grasp and control, we come closer to an understanding of the spiritual. Spirituality involves first an awareness, if you are aware of your surroundings. That comes not through the eyes, the ears, the hands, or any specific sense, but through a larger openness, a general opening up to life's experiences. And that awareness implies a sensitivity to others. We first discover that spirituality is there in the world because we notice its effects not in ourselves but on others. As the trees and the grasses bend with the force of the wind, so do human beings move within the force and power of the spirit, inspired by it no matter how hard we try to take charge, no matter how adamantly we claim to be in control. For spirituality is always beyond control. We can't hold it in our hands and touch it, manipulate it, or destroy it, because it is beyond control. It is also beyond possession. We can't own it, lock it up, divide it among ourselves, or take it away from others. Beyond all else, spiritual means other than material. To those who first used the word spirituality, it signified led by or lived by the spirit. Such a life is lived in contrast to a life centered in material reality. It involves a different way of seeing, one wary of appearances. Proverbs that capture the wisdom sayings of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures remind that charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting advising that we praise not a man for his looks and despise not a man for his appearance, for appearances tend to be illusory. Least is the bee among winged things, but she reaps the choicest of harvests, as the biblical wisdom writer illustrates. Appearances tend also to be irrelevant. The daughter of Caesar said to Rabbi Yahshua ben Hanania, why is glorious wisdom contained in an ugly vessel like you? He said to her, well, Does your father keep his wine in earthen vessels? She said to him, In what else should he keep it? He said to her, You people of importance should keep it in gold and silver. Well, she immediately went and told her father, who put the wine into golden and silver vessels. When it soured, Caesar confronted his daughter. Who told you to do this? She said to him, Rabbi Yahshua ben Hanania. Caesar called the rabbi to him and asked, Why did you tell that to my daughter? What she told me, the rabbi replied, I told her. Caesar said, but there are also beautiful people who are scholars. And if they were ugly, they would be even greater scholars. Spirituality is discovered beyond immediate perceptions, thus founded 
and a contrast with immediate perceptions. Spirituality always involves both an affirmation, yes, there is something here, and a rejection, but there is more to it than meets the eye. The reality of limitation. There is a crack in everything God has made. Ralph Waldo Emerson. It seems absolutely necessary for most of us to get over the idea that man is God. Bill Wilson. Correspondence. A priest of the Greek Orthodox Church, Father Thomas Hopko, tells of a monk he met on Mount Athos. He was in a very bad state, very dark, very bitter, very angry. When asked what was the matter, he said, Look at me. I've been here for thirty-eight years, and I have not yet attained pure prayer. And this other fellow on the pilgrimage was saying how sad he thought this was. Another man present said, It's a sad story, all right, but the sadness consists in the fact that after thirty-eight years in a monastery, he's still interested in pure prayer. The image both troubles and consoles. The befuddled, bitter monk, unable to see that his futile quest for pure prayer is precisely the cause of his deepest anguish, and the observer recognizing not only the reality of the sadness, but its source, the impossible ideal of perfection. To deny imperfection is to disown oneself. For to be human is to be imperfect. Spirituality, which is rooted in and revealed by uncertainties, inadequacies, helplessness, the lack and the failure of control, supplies a context and suggests a way of living in which our imperfections can be endured. Spiritual sensibilities begin to flower when the soil is fertilized with the understanding that something is awry. There is, after all, something wrong with us. Throughout the century, spiritual writers and thinkers have expressed this experience of awryness as a sense of being off balance, out of kilter, ungrounded, fractured, broken, twisted, or torn apart. Almost 2,500 years ago, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, declared the first of his four noble truths in three words, life is is suffering. To describe this suffering, Buddha used the word dukkha, which means a bone or axle out of its socket, broken and torn apart from itself. But perhaps the clearest exploration of this paradox can be found in the Desert Fathers. These ascetics went out into the desert in a search of a setting that would allow them to explore the nature of the human being that their faith told them had been redeemed. The desert became a laboratory for studying what it means to be human. The wastelands of Egypt and the hillsides of the Near East may seem distant from modern times and concerns, but these ancient spiritual teachers shaped the themes that would be analyzed and reformulated through centuries into modern times. Their explorations depicted our human sense of alienation in terms of an inner tension or struggle. As early as the middle of the second century, the apostolic Father Hermes described the conflict between the good and the bad angels within each of us. Because these spiritual forces can exert a powerful influence over us, we must take care, he warned, not to put our trust in the wrong angel. Hermes offers no hope that we can entirely rid ourselves of the bad angel within us. He suggests not a plan for perfection, but a program of survival, surviving our imperfections. We all sin. We all fall short from time to time. The important question is, will we survive those fallings short? Our sins. A sense of balance. Somewhere in each of us were a mixture of light and of darkness, of love and of hate, of trust and of fear. Jean Vanier. A preacher put this question to a class of children. If all the good people in the world were red, 
and all the bad people were green, what color would you be? Little Linda Jean thought mightily for a moment. Then her face brightened and she replied, Reverend, I'd be streaky. The most ancient wisdom of the human race is the vision of the human as essentially mixed, somehow in the middle. To be human is to be fundamentally finite, essentially limited, not God. And yet at the same time, to be human is to be capable of more, to be capable of both wisdom and love that transcend the limitations of time. In a very real sense, then, to be human is to be caught in an impossible situation. We crave that which is essentially beyond us. This paradoxical insight has been stated variously throughout the ages. The ancient Egyptians and Greeks portrayed human beings as less than the gods, more than the beasts, yet somehow also both. Among the earliest classic myths, we find the tale of how the human race sprang from the remains of the terrible Titans, who, because they had eaten an infant god, contained a tiny portion of divine soul stuff, which was to be passed on to humans. This Titan myth neatly explained to the ancient Greek why he felt himself to be at once a god and a criminal, why he experienced both the Apolline awareness of remoteness from the divine and the Dionysian inkling of identity with it. This paradox of dissonance and incompleteness was embodied by the ancient Greeks in the figure of Dionysus, the god of wine, paunchy, unsteady of gait, a foolishly lewd grin on his sagging face. Most pictorial representations of Dionysus are sufficiently detailed that modern clinicians readily recognize the mythic god as a classic alcoholic. His reported behavior, which ranged unpredictably from sentimental to savage, confirms the diagnosis. Yet because Dionysus represented not only the destructive power of alcohol, but also its social and salutary influences, he was viewed as the promoter of civilization and a lover of of peace. Like his compatriot Demeter, goddess of the harvest, Dionysus was both a joy god and a suffering god. The ancient Greeks explored these paradoxes in stories about their gods. Later generations would utilize different images, different vocabularies, different stories. Two thousand years after Dionysus' downfall, the French mathematician and mystic Blaise Pascal reflected in his famous Pensees, which was written in 1654, on the misery and grandeur of man, caught between the two abysses of the infinite and nothing. Soren Kierkegaard observed in the 19th century that the self is a union of the infinite possibility of the spirit with the finitude of the body and of everyday life. 20th century philosopher historian William Barrett suggests that postmodern thought begins with the rediscovery that man occupies a middle position in the universe between the infinitesimal and the infinite. He is an all in relation to nothingness, a nothingness in relation to the all. This middle position of man is the final and dominant fact of the human condition. It is also a perfect image of the finitude of human existence. Man is his finitude. And almost simultaneously with the flourishing of Alcoholics Anonymous, American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr pointed out that man, who stands at the juncture of nature and spirit, is the subject of both freedom and necessity. On the one hand, he's involved in the order of nature and is therefore bound. But on the other hand, as spirit, he transcends nature and himself and is therefore free. 
Being both bound and free, both limited and unlimited, he invariably experiences anxiety. Caught between the infinite and the nothing, darkness and light, the end of things and their beginning, misery and grandeur, certain knowledge and absolute ignorance, the human being is in a decidedly disordered state. Classic imagery portrays this confused condition as being both beast and angel. A more modern expression emphasizes that both the best and the beast reside within each of us. For it is when that bothness is denied that problems arise. He who would be an angel becomes a beast, observed Pascal. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the Spanish-born American philosopher George Santayana developed the corollary to Pascal's image. It is necessary to be a beast if one is ever to be a spirit. In our own times, the anthropologist Ernest Becker, aware that he was dying of cancer at age 49, even as he was completing his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, The Denial of Death, captured his anguished thoughts on the subject of man's dual nature in a description both vulgar and vivid. Man is a god who shits. The ultimate reflection of our two-sided nature is the uniquely human knowledge that we are going to die. That's the unique gift that humans have above all other animals. They can share their death with each other, suggested William Barrett in The Illusion of Technique. And the Sufi tell an older story. One day, the blessed Jesus caught a sheep from a pasturing flock and said something in its ear. The sheep stopped eating grass and would take no water. A few days later, as the blessed Jesus was passing that same pasture, he pointed to the sheep and said to the shepherd, Is that animal sick? Why is it not eating grass and taking water like the rest? Not recognizing him, the shepherd replied, A person recently passed this way and said something in this sheep's ear. From that day to this, the animal has been stupefied. If you are curious to know what the venerable Jesus said in the sheep's ear, let me tell you what the blessed Jesus said was, death exists. Although it was only an animal, when it heard of death, that sheep stopped eating and drinking and went into this state of stupor. The sages and saints leave no doubt that to be human is to be caught between a rock and a hard place, or perhaps more accurately, between heaven and hell. But then we moderns know that all we have to do is listen to ourselves talk. I'm so confused. I'm all torn up. I'm hopelessly muddled. I don't know who I am. Titles of recent so-called self-help books confirm our inability to accept the reality of our own paradox, killing ourselves with kindness. Am I well yet? Afraid to live, afraid to die. When am I going to be happy? Experiencing the spiritual. Unawareness is the root of all evil. Anonymous Egyptian monk. Spirituality is above all a way of life. We don't just think about it or feel it or sense it all around us. We live it. Spirituality permeates to the very core of our human being, affecting the way we perceive the world around us, the way we feel about that world, and the choices we make based on our perceptions and sensations. In the experience of spirituality, three essential elements are always at play. What we see, how we feel, and why we choose. Rabbi Levi Yitchkak of Berdichev once encountered a man eating on the fast day of Tishubayev. Surely you have forgotten that this is a fast day, he said. No, answered the man. I, I know today is Tishubayev. Aha, you are not well, and your doctor has instructed you not to fast, said the rabbi. No, 
I am perfectly healthy, the man replied. Rabbi Levi Hitchcock lifted his eyes toward heaven. Look how precious your children are, dear God. I have provided this man with ample excuse to explain away his behavior. But he refuses to deviate from the truth, even when it incriminates him. What a stubborn, rebellious man. Someone else might have concluded, but Rabbi Levi Yitchcock saw the good which enabled him to feel brotherhood with the man. Or was it his feeling of brotherhood with his fellow Jew that allowed the rabbi to see the good? Or were the seeing and the feeling both results of some prior choice? The word experience speaks to the wholeness, the fitting together of seeing, feeling, and willing. Experience is more than just feeling because it also involves knowing, and it is more than just seeing because it is knowledge of as well as knowledge about. Experience signifies a kind of hands-on grasp that reaches out to taste the honey even as it tries to understand sweetness. Experience knows life not as an object to observe, but as a living, breathing reality that can be creatively embraced. And that fully returns the embrace. People sometimes think of spirituality as if it were mainly feeling, an episode of rapture, a warm sensation of belonging, or primarily willing, the act of choosing. But of the three essential elements of the experience of spirituality, seeing holds a kind of necessary priority. Even if Rabbi Levi Yitchcock was able to see the good because he felt brotherhood with his fellow Jew, he first had to recognize that man's Jewishness for the story to begin. We must learn first the proper way of viewing things, as the Jesuit priest Jean-Pierre Quassade insisted in introducing his 18th century novices to spirituality story. Quassade did not mean seeing with our physical eyes, but with an inner vision that looks at the world in a way that sees self in context. This type of vision is often confused with thinking, but the two are distinct, so distinct, in fact, that thinking too much about things can result in an inability to see them. I begin to see an object when I cease to understand it, noted Thoreau. And Chinese Zen master Shen Hui suggested the true seeing is when there is no seeing. Shen Hui's observation reminds that there can be a trap in the metaphor of seeing. The first seeing, in his aphorism, the true seeing signifies experiencing, which involves not just the eyes, but all the powers of sensation. The tradition of a spirituality of imperfection, with its emphasis on storytelling and story listening, suggests that of all the senses, hearing enjoys a real claim to precedence. For one thing, as the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer observed, unlike seeing, where one can look away, one cannot hear away but must listen. Hearing implies already belonging together in such a manner that one is claimed by what is being said. Hearing involves intimacies too frequently forgotten. When a man whose marriage was in trouble sought his advice, the master said, you must learn to listen to your wife. The man took this advice to heart and returned after a month to say that he had learned to listen to every word his wife was saying. And said the master with a smile, Now go home and listen to every word she isn't saying. The sensations of taste and smell which thrive in spiritual tradition, especially in the East, are also part of the vision that is spirituality. Recall the story of the master who asked his disciples if they could put into words the fragrance of a rose. All of them were silent. Perhaps because the senses of smell and taste are simply ineffable, the experiences are impossible to put into words. Efforts to capture the fullness of the experience of spirituality frequently appeal to the sense of sweetness. 
Commenting on the Rosh Hashanah prayer for a good and sweet year, Abraham Tversky, who is both a psychiatrist and an Orthodox rabbi, explains, Good can be understood intellectually, but sweet is a sense experience which even a little child can appreciate. We ask God for uncomplicated and unsophisticated goodness, the sweet kind of good that can be appreciated by all rather than that which is understood only by people of profound faith. Give us simple good, sweet as honey. Shared vision, shared hope. To feel less alone is without doubt an ultimate quest of all life, yet perhaps never before has loneliness been so widespread as it is today. Martina Horner Rabbi Hanok loved to tell this story. For a whole year I felt a longing to go to my master, Rabbi Bunim, and talk with him, but every time I entered the house I felt I wasn't man enough. Once, though, when I was walking across a field and weeping, I knew that I must run to the rabbi without delay. He asked, Why are you weeping? I answered, I am, after all, alive in this world, a being created with all the senses and all the limbs, but I do not know what it is I was created for and what I am good for in this world. Little fool, he replied. That's the same question I have carried around with me all my life. You will come and eat the evening meal with me today. Spirituality is nurtured in community. The oneness with others that springs from shared vision and shared goal, shared memory and shared hope. As Ignatius of Antioch advised first century Christians, one cultivates the way of life that is spirituality by seeking out the company of the saints, those seeking to live the same way of life. While spirituality can be discovered in solitude by retreating to a cell of some kind, by reading, thinking, meditating, praying, it can be fulfilled only in community. The desert Abba Pohlman offered a telling observation. It's possible to spend a hundred years in your cell without ever learning anything. Many hundreds of years later, the Hasidic rabbi Yachab Yitzchak clearly stated the reason. The way cannot be learned out of a book or from hearsay, but can only be communicated from person to person. Why do we need community? St. Basil criticizing a life lived in service to the needs of the individual. As plainly in conflict with the law of love, asked, Whose feet wilt thou then wash? Whom wilt thou care for? And St. Augustine offered an interpretation of a familiar New Testament story that one popular modern speaker embellishes in explaining why, even though he is convinced that a higher power saved him, from his alcoholism, he still needs alcoholic synonymous. It's sort of like the raising of Lazarus from the dead. After Jesus had called Lazarus forth from the tomb, he told the bystanders to free him from his burial bonds. My higher power raised me, called me forth from my alcoholism, but I need the other drunks and alcoholics anonymous to unwrap me, to let me loose and keep me loose from it. Rather than asking why we need community, it may be more important to ask how we need others. Wisdom's answer to that question, the answer embodied in the spirituality of imperfection, is that human beings need each other precisely in relationships of mutuality. Mutuality involves not just give or get, nor even give and get. In relationships of mutuality, we give by getting and get by giving recognizing that we truly gain only what we seek to give and that we are able to give only that which we are seeking to gain. That may sound complicated, but the experience of mutuality is the foundation of the very existence of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the main discovery that Bill Wilson made in his first meeting with Dr. Bob Smith 
Bill got sober in early December 1934. For several months he tried to help other alcoholics by sharing his newfound sobriety with them. Those he approached showed no interest. Then in early May of 1935, Wilson went to Akron, Ohio on a business deal which promptly fell through. On the day before Mother's Day, Bill paced the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in Akron, getting more and more depressed. Sounds of laughter and of ice tinkling in glasses wafted from the bar, and he caught himself thinking a thought that he had not had in over five months. I need a drink. It was hardly a new concept. But then, that impulse was pushed out of his mind by an idea that was completely new. No, I don't need a drink. I need another alcoholic. And striding purposefully away from the bar and toward the lobby telephone booths, Bill Wilson began the series of calls that led him the next day to meet Dr. Robert Holbrook Smith, who would become AA's co-founder. Twenty years later, retelling this story at AA's coming-of-age convention, Wilson explained why his meeting with Dr. Bob had been different, why, after all his earlier failures, this meeting had worked. You see, our talk was a completely mutual thing. I knew that I needed this alcoholic as much as he needed me. This was it. And this mutual give and take is at the very heart of all AA's 12th step work today. The final missing link was located right there in my first talk with Dr. Bob. The point is reinforced by the experience of the alcoholic who became AA number three, Bill D. Had already been hospitalized many times as a result of his drinking. Because of his prominence in the community, many had tried to help him. None had succeeded. Why then did he listen to Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith when these two strangers confronted him? What was different about their approach? All the other people that had talked to me wanted to help me, and my pride prevented me from listening to them caused only resentment on my part, but I felt as if I would be a real stinker if I did not listen to a couple of fellows for a short time, if that would cure them. Mutuality, the awareness that life's most precious realities, love, wisdom, sobriety, are attained only in the giving of them and are given only in the openness to receive them. A half century after AA's founding, Jean Venier, former naval officer, former philosophy professor, former student for the Catholic priesthood, offered an understanding of mutuality derived from his meditation on the story of the confrontation between Jesus of Nazareth and the sinful woman. He does not tell the woman who approaches him, Mary Magdalene, to get her act together. He does not just forgive her or heal her, which will prove, after all, to be the same. Rather, he begins by exposing to her his need. He says, I need you. Spirituality is essential but different. An illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Bob Smith and Bill Wilson looked down at the falsely hearty, still shaking figure on the hospital bed. Both men knew the torn feelings and the desperate hope that had hid under that facade. Wilson had been sober six months, Dr. Smith for barely a week. The specter of what they had once been stared back at them both, and they endured a moment of doubt. Had they bitten off more than they could chew? The nurse had filled them in on some of the details of this case. Bill D., a prominent attorney, was a former city councilman and church vestryman. He was also, the weary nurse confided, a real corker. This was his eighth detoxification in six months, and within minutes of entering the hospital he had physically assaulted two nurses, leaving both with black eyes. The three men chatted for a while, and it quickly became apparent to Bill D. that his visitors knew what they were talking about, that they were real drunks who were now happily sober, 
an earth-shattering concept if there ever was one, and maybe he'd better listen up, see if he could learn something. But like most alcoholics, Bill D. was better at talking than listening. And he droned on and on about his drinking, his despair, and the utter ruin of his life. Wilson finally interrupted, explaining that he and Dr. Smith had to give their program to someone else if they were to stay sober themselves. And so they had to know, was Bill D. really certain that he wanted it? Because if he wasn't certain, he was doing something much worse than wasting their time. He was actually endangering their sobriety. And they wouldn't stay around and nag at him if he wasn't ready. They would have to be going and looking for someone else. Entranced by the clear-eyed enthusiasm of these two men, even as they spoke of their own hopelessness, Bill D. declared that yes, he wanted the program, but when his visitors began talking about a spiritual program and a higher power, he shook his head. No, no, he said emphatically. It's too late for me. I still believe in God, all right, but I know mighty well that he doesn't believe in me anymore. Well, Smith and Wilson were not about to give up on their first recruit. They told Bill D. they understood how he felt, and then they left, promising to visit again the next day. They did return, and over the next several days, they visited again and again. One morning, they arrived to find Bill D. sitting up in bed, talking excitedly with his wife. During the previous night, he explained, hope had dawned, and he understood that if Bob and Bill can do it, I can do it. Maybe we can all do together what we could not do separately. A few days later, Dr. Smith, the more conventionally religious of AA's two co-founders, stopped by on his daily visit with Bill D., who would some years later be known as Alcoholics Anonymous Number 3. As they chatted, something in one of the first recruits' remarks, a bit of cynicism about help from a power greater than himself, caught the surgeon's attention, and he decided to confront him. Young man... Dr. Smith challenged in his resonant baritone. Have you abandoned your God? Bill D. was not even momentarily taken aback. Calmly, but with a great deal of quiet pain, he answered, Gee, no, Doc, I don't think so, but I sure feel that my God has abandoned me. That cry of abandonment captures the experience of so many human beings who live in despair, who search endlessly for a meaning in a cruel, chaotic, unjust world. The hidden God is a challenge, for if there is a God, and just about everybody at one time or another doubts even this part, he, she, or it seems to be hiding this may sound like a very modern malaise, but the complaint is not new. Not magic, but miracle. The problem of evil has baffled mankind since Eden, perhaps because it can only be approached through facing the mystery of good, and we do not like to acknowledge that good is a mystery. D.M. Dueling. Miracle is simply the wonder of the unique that points us back to the wonder of the everyday. Maurice Friedman One of the early issues of The Grapevine, AA's unofficial monthly publication, reported on a bantering conversation about why AA works. Opinions varied from moral philosophy to behavior conditioning, from extolling the joys of sober fellowship to emphasizing the usefulness of reminders to remember when. Finally, Bill Wilson spoke up. Why AA works is fundamentally a mystery. When we consider that for thousands of years, few alcoholics escaped from their misery and that we are now witnessing a wholesale escape, that adds up to a miracle, and a miracle is a mystery. And miracle, Bill and the other early AAs knew from their own experience of alcoholism and recovery, is exactly the opposite of magic. Miracle involves openness to mystery, the welcoming of surprise, the acceptance of those realities over which we have no control, Magic is the attempt to be in control, to manage everything, 
It is the claim to be or to have a special relationship with some kind of God. Spirituality is aligned not with magic and the effort to control it, but with miracle, the wonder of the unique that points us back to the wonder of the everyday. Novelist Nikos Katsanzakis retells the story. In the remote mountains of northern Greece, there once lived a monk who had desired all his life to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, to walk three times around it, to kneel, and to return home a new person. Gradually, through the years, he had saved what money he could, begging in the villages nearby, and finally, near the end of his life, had enough set aside to begin his trip. He opened the gates of the monastery and, staff in hand, set out with great anticipation on his way to Jerusalem. But no sooner had he left the cloister than he encountered a man in rags, sad and bent to the ground, picking herbs. Where are you going, father? the man asked. To the holy sepulchre, brother. By God's grace, I shall walk three times around it, kneel, and return home a different man from what I am. How much money to do that do you have, father? inquired the man. Thirty pounds, the monk answered. Give me the thirty pounds, said the beggar. I have a wife and hungry children. Give me the money. Walk three times around me. Then kneel and go back into your monastery. The monk thought for a moment, scratching the ground with his staff, then took the thirty pounds from his sack, gave the whole of it to the poor man, walked three times around him, knelt, and went back through the gates of his monastery. He returned home a new person, of course, having recognized that the beggar was Christ himself. Not in some magical place far away, but right outside his monastery door, mysteriously close, in abandoning his quest for the remote, the special, the somehow magical, the monk discovered a meaning far more profound in the ordinary experience close to home. All that he had given up came suddenly rushing back to him with a joy unforeseen. To be surprised by grace is a gift still to be prized. We do not create miracles, we witness them. In witnessing them, we must acknowledge that they exist. In acknowledging that they exist, we must admit that we do not know why or how. Somehow above and beyond human reason, miracle, like mystery, is inexplicable, unsolvable, and incomprehensible. Underlying the very concept of miracle is the simple acceptance that we're not in ultimate total control. This is also, of course, the inherent, eternal, fundamental message of spirituality. You cannot control everything. You are a human being, and human beings make mistakes. And that's okay, because you are a human being, not a god. At the heart of all spirituality is a sense of wonder and surprise, the awe that accepts that it can only marvel and delight, whether at the magnificence of a landscape, the sublimity of a symphony, or the incomprehensible beauty of self-sacrificing love. Awe, one writer suggests, is a reflex of the spirit. One penalty inflicted by the need to control is the failure of awe and wonder and the consequent inability to see miracle. Anxious determination to take control, to be in charge, reveals the failure of spirituality. Addiction represents the ultimate effort to control the definitive demand for magic and the final failure of spirituality. Turning to the magic of chemicals signifies the desperate and doomed attempt to fill a spiritual void with a material reality to make magic a substitute for miracle. 
addiction has been described as the belief that whenever there is something wrong with me, it can be fixed by something outside of me. And that false start generates ever more drastic illusions. The search for the quick fix, inevitably unfulfilled by drugs and unsated by material things, leaps next to spiritual realities in the search for instant spirituality, some sort of quick spiritual fix. It is no wonder, then, that locating divinity in drugs becomes a kind of spiritual death. an open-ended spirituality. But as for the AA therapy itself, that could be practiced in any fashion that the group wished to practice it. And the same went for every individual. We took the position that AA was not the final word on treatment, that it might be only the first word. For us, it became perfectly safe to tell people they could experiment with our therapy in any way they liked. Bill W. Woe to the man so possessed that he thinks he possesses God. Martin Buber. A. A. Co-finder Bill Wilson, chief writer of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, author of the Handbook, Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions, and the historical narrative, Alcoholics Anonymous, Comes of Age, intended to write one last book, to be titled practicing these principles in all our affairs. It would delineate AA spirituality. Bill began the project in April 1961 with an article in the AA grapevine titled God as we understand him, the dilemma of no faith. Subsequent articles on humility for today, this matter of honesty, this matter of fear, and what is acceptance, followed in irregularly over the next year, each labeled one of a series. Then, in the July 1962 grapevine, the series came to an unannounced end with an article titled Spiritual Experiences. The proposed book was never published, though Bill wrote more than 20 more articles for the grapevine and lived until 1971. What happened to the spirituality book is a question never directly addressed, but one answer can be found in this story. One evening at a meeting, during the time he was working on the book, Bill noticed an AA member of obvious spiritual depth. Hoping to plumb his experience, Bill approached the man after the meeting. You seem to have a real spirituality, Wilson began. Oh, no, the man replied quickly, cutting Bill off. I mean, thanks, I, I am working on the spiritual angle, but if you want to know about spirituality, you'd better talk to Donald over there. Or maybe you could look up Phil. He moved about a month ago, but look, I'll get his new telephone number for you. That's how I learned the most important thing about spirituality. Bill always mused in retelling the story. Those who have it don't know that they have it. And that is why Bill never finished that book on spirituality, for he understood the paradox all too well. Anyone who claimed to be an expert on the subject of spirituality would not be able to produce a book worth reading. Spirituality is one of those realities that you have only so long as you seek it. As soon as you think you have it, you've lost it. In rediscovering this basic spiritual insight, the earliest members of AA tapped the essence of open-endedness that characterizes a spirituality of imperfection. Spirituality is boundless, unable to be fenced in. We do not capture it. It captures us. As much as we might like to wrap things up to lock spirituality in and hold it fast, it will forever escape our grasp. In the long story of spirituality, many images have been used in the effort to convey its open-endedness. In the modern age, we tend to favor the metaphor of growth. The literature of therapy and popular writings on self-help have thrived on this image, describing growth in biological terms as a spontaneous and largely automatic process, profoundly shaped by outside factors such as parents, teachers, and peers. Lives can thus be read like the rings of a tree, with events and experiences leaving their marks deeply and permanently embedded in our psyche. As the twig is bent, 
these early aberrations can never be entirely undone. The classic literature on spirituality suggests a more ancient image for the spiritual life, that of building, in which our life's time is occupied in the construction of a spiritual edifice, a kind of home. The rich metaphor of architecture offers several advantages. It invites thinking in terms of tools, materials, and choices. Which tools, which materials do we choose to use in shaping our spiritual abode? Building also requires a plan, or at least planning, and so thinking how and what one chooses to see makes a difference to the outcome. And finally, although the task of construction is laborious, mistakes can be undone, and what is learned from them can be used to improve the structure as a whole. A pervasive spirituality. Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. From the Twelve Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. A few years ago, at an alcoholism treatment center in the suburbs of Chicago, staff members reported an intriguing discovery. Many of them lived at some distance from the facility, each day braving the hazards of tollway traffic and commuting to and from work. Then one day, the state of Illinois instituted honor system toll collection booths in that area. No attendant, no barrier gate, just a basket into which motorists were expected to throw their coins. Data are unavailable about how well the methods served in meeting the highway department's fiscal and traffic flow needs, but counselors at the treatment center collected observations that soon added up to an axiom. Those who don't throw their money in, their patients don't get well. As one counselor put it in telling the story, how can you pass on an honest program if you aren't honest yourself? Honesty is indivisible. Spirituality is a reality that must touch all of one's life or it touches none of one's life. Spirituality is pervasive for the same reason that spirituality cannot be analyzed. The spiritual has no parts. And because the spiritual has no parts, it cannot touch only part of us. Spirituality's pervasiveness, then, has two dimensions. The spiritual not only touches all of our surface, it penetrates to all our depths. We must live it, think it, feel it, and most important, act it in our own lives. For only if we do it, only if we practice it, will we come to understand what it is. Spirituality thus resides at our center, flowing into all that we are and do. It is at the very core of our being. We cannot borrow it, putting it on for an hour or a day, using it like a cloak to cover the hardness in our heart or the angry or jealous thoughts in our mind. Spirituality is not a pet project that we can take up for a month or two. It is never hobby. Pervasive is an extraordinarily difficult concept to convey. Perhaps a story will help. Some years ago, a student of 12-step spirituality offered a presentation at the newly established Renewal Center of Hazelton, one of the oldest and most renowned centers for the treatment of alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. As he was laboring to make his point about the pervasive nature of spirituality, one of the participants asked for an image to help her picture the words. What is it like? she asked, her expression earnest and intent. I think I understand what you mean, but can you give me a picture? Well, momentarily stumped, the presenter sat for several frustrating minutes, staring across the conference lounge at the massive stone fireplace, so carefully fashioned out of rock, deposited in the locality during Minnesota's glacial area. Late afternoon sun streamed into the room, warming the stones with light. Suddenly, 
the stones themselves came into focus. Perhaps he could use them for an image. The deep reddish rocks flecked with golden specks, the green-hued pieces irregularly marbled in white, the many shaded blue slabs, their shallow niches sparkling as if with silver. Which of these stones could best represent the spiritual? physical, mental, spiritual, the phrase reverberated in his mind, but which of the rocks provided the best image for each of those realities? Well, the workshop participants, ever polite and patient, shifted quietly in the rare silence, Then suddenly the image came. Looking at the stones, wondering at their beauty, the presenter's vision made one of those gestalt switches, and he saw not the individual stones, but the chimney itself. The mortar, the bland, grayish, pebbly stuff that held all those stones together, that was the spiritual. The spiritual is not some separate category, one specific type of stone or a particular stone of great beauty, but the substance that holds everything together. Spirituality is like that mortar in the fireplace he offered pensively, finally breaking the long silence. Just as the mortar makes the chimney a chimney, allowing it to stand up straight and tall, beautiful in its wholeness, the spiritual is what makes us wholly human. It holds our experiences together, shapes them into a whole, gives them meaning, allows them and us to be whole. Without the spiritual, however physically brave or healthy or strong we may be, however mentally smart or clever or brilliant we may be, however emotionally integrated or mature we may be, we are somehow not all there. Release. Come to the edge. No, we will fall. Come to the edge. No, we will fall. They came to the edge. He pushed them and they flew. Apollinaire. Everything terrifying is in its deepest being something helpless that wants our help. Rainer Marie Wilke. Many readers will be familiar with a marginally humorous story of antique vintage. Clifford was leaning against the fence, enjoying a beautiful view from the top of the Grand Canyon, when the wooden posts suddenly ripped from their cement moorings. Seconds later, Clifford was plunging down into the abyss. Halfway to the bottom, his desperate arm waving helped Clifford catch and clutch the branch of a scrubby tree that grew from the canyon wall. Grasping, gasping, he looked both up and down. No way could he climb that sheer cliff, even if he could swing his body toward the wall. But below yawned the chasm, unbroken by any other tree or holding place. To fall would be to die, horribly crushed on the rocks below. No one had seen him fall, and he hung there out of sight, knowing that the wind would scatter his weak voice no matter how loudly he shouted. Desperate, Clifford cried out to the heavens, God, help me. Hearing his own trembling voice, he wailed again, Please, God, help me. To Clifford's amazement, he heard an immediate answer. All right, came the voice. The initial warmth Clifford felt turned to a chill wind, gripping his body as the voice continued, Let's go. Looking down, Clifford saw the huge boulders waiting below, and he knew again that if he let go, he would surely die. Let go, he thought, but God, you don't understand, he yelled up. I'm too far up. I'll let go, the voice repeated. Silence filled the canyon. Then, in a week, 
terrified voice, Clifford called out, Is there anyone else up there? The story is corny, except that it is true. True of every one of us in the sense that it conveys a powerful spiritual truth. So long as we cling, we are bound. The alcoholic knows that truth as well as anyone on this earth, for it is the very essence of addiction to cling to some fixed, repetitive, once meaningful, but now self-destructive pattern. Yet the alcoholic and the rest of us, in one way or another, hang on. Let go, the voice calls out. Let go of the bottle or the pills, the possessions, the power, the pride, and you shall be free. But the insistent whine refuses. Please, anything but that. Take anything but that. We crave release, but we refuse to release. And so long as we cling, we are bound. Spirituality is experienced first as release, but release, although it involves a true freeing, is not the same as freedom. Freedom cannot be given. It must be won. Release, on the contrary, is experienced rather than gotten, received rather than attained. And so it does not work to tell one's story in order to attain release, yet release does emerge from the practice of telling one's story. When we let the truth about ourselves be revealed, we experience a kind of release, wrote Michael Zimmerman in his study of Martin Heidegger. Note the wording, we let the truth be revealed, implying an openness rather than some kind of exhibitionism, conveying a sense of wonder rather than of triumph. The experience of release has been described as the chains falling away, a light going on, a weight lifted, something giving way. The very language attests that the experience is not one of triumph, I did it, but one of awe and wonder. I somehow see what I never saw before. The awareness that we do not earn this experience, but are given it, reveals life itself and the experiences within it as gift. Gratitude. Thinking is a kind of thanking. In thanking, we accept the gift of existence. In accepting ourselves, we become ourselves. As released, we gratefully enter into the play of which we are already a part. Releasement means homecoming. Thinking as thanking means loving. Michael Zimmerman Gratitude is heaven itself. William Blake A blind man was begging in a city park. Someone approached and asked him whether people were giving generously. The blind man shook a nearby empty tin. His visitor said to him, Let me write something on your card. The blind man agreed. That evening the visitor returned. Well, how were things today? The blind man showed him a tin full of money and asked, What on earth did you write on that card? Oh, said the other, I merely wrote, Today is a spring day, and I am blind. Because release is a gift, a reality not earned, not merited, not attained in any way, there flows naturally from the experience of release the experiencing of gratitude. And gratitude can best be defined and understood as the only possible response to a gift, to something recognized as utterly freely given. Gratitude is the vision, the way of seeing that recognizes gift. Our culture seems on the verge of losing the meaning of the experience, of gratitude, in part because we've lost all sense of gift. Our ritual occasions of giving, from the traditional birthdays and anniversaries to the industry-created special days for everyone, from grandparents to secretaries, mean that there's always handy some occasion to give a gift, with the result that a true gift is never given, for a gift is something freely and spontaneously given. A true gift is inspired rather than occasioned. After attending a conference, a man walked down the streets of a strange city, whiling away the hours before his plane left. Enjoying the stroll and the window shopping, 
he spotted a singularly attractive cashmere sweater. And thinking affectionately of his wife, who loved cashmere, the man walked into the shop, purchased the sweater, and asked the salesperson to gift wrap it. When he arrived home, he handed the gift to his wife, who looked at him at first in surprise, but then with something approaching suspicion. Opening the gift, she examined it appreciatively, but then looked up to ask, And what is this for? The experience of gratitude has been lost, too, because we tend to think of it primarily as some kind of feeling. Do you want a shivery, warm feeling that makes you tingle all the way through your body? Linus asks Charlie Brown in a famous cartoon parody. Well, go pee in your pants. Feelings are fine, but they are also transient and ephemeral. Gratitude is not a feeling, but an ongoing vision of thankfulness that recognizes the gifts constantly being received. A feeling is fleeting, an emotion for the moment. Gratitude is a mindset a way of seeing and thinking that is rooted in a remembrance, the remembrance of being without the gift. As the philosopher William Barrett reminds, think and thank are kindred roots, and the German word andenken, literally to think on, means to remember. Hence, think, thank, and remembrance are related notions. Real thinking, thinking that is rooted in being, is at once an act of thanking and remembrance. So gratitude is the vision that sees gift and recognizes how gifted we are. This vision has always been recognized as a core experience of spirituality. The early American theologian Jonathan Edwards described in his treatise concerning religious affections how the saints were characterized by a new inward perception or sensation of their minds entirely different in its nature and kind from anything that ever their minds were the subjects of before they were sanctified. Those who seek spirituality, that is to say, see reality differently. It is not that they see things that others cannot see, but rather that they see what everyone else sees, but in seeing, recognizing all reality, its aspect of gift. Humility. St. Bernard asked to list the four cardinal virtues, answered, humility, 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 and humility. You alone can do it, but you cannot do it alone. O oh, Hobart Maurer. A man went to Wahab Imri and said, Teach me humility. Wahab answered, I cannot do that, because humility is a teacher of itself. It is learnt by means of its practice. If you cannot practice it, you cannot learn it. Many scholars point to the Gesta Romanorum, a compilation of 181 medieval morality tales, as our most ancient storybook. The 26th tale runs as follows. There was a queen who dishonored herself with a servant and bore him a son. This son, on arriving at years of maturity, practiced every description of wickedness and conducted himself with the greatest insolence toward the prince, his reputed father. The prince, unable to account for such perversion of mind, interrogated the mother as to the legitimacy of her child, and finding, by her reluctant confession, that he was not his son. Though loath to deprive him of the kingdom, he ordained that his dress for the time to come should be of different texture and color, one side to be composed of the most ordinary materials and the other of the most valuable, so that when he looked upon the baser portion, his pride might be abated, and the vicious propensities in which he had indulged, relinquished. On the other hand, when he surveyed the more gorgeous part, his hopes might be raised and his spirit animated to goodness. By this judicious device, he became remarkable for humility and ever after abandoned his dishonest life. In an era that fawns on the rich and famous and adopts as its rallying cry, Me first, Humility is a concept scorned, or worse, neglected. We know it, or 
failed to know it, mainly in its caricatures, the fictional Casper milk toast, the cringing spouse or the spineless employee, the ancient favorable sense of the word connoting mildness, modesty, patience of spirit, and the willingness to remove oneself from the center of the universe, has been eroded in the modern era by unfavorable interpretations in which lowly calls to mind servility and self-abasement. Meek is equated with cowardly submissiveness, and mildness is interpreted as blandness. Plain vanilla ice cream in a freezer, crowded with chocolate raspberry truffle and Swiss almond praline. Humility as earthiness may be less a distortion than humility, as groveling or timidity, but each of these modern interpretations misses the essence of this ancient classic virtue. For humility signifies simply the acceptance of being human, the acceptance of one's human being. It is the embrace of the both and ness both saint and sinner, both beast and angel, that constitutes our very being as human, beginning with the acceptance that being human, being mixed, and therefore sometimes mixed up, is good enough. Humility involves learning how to live with and take joy in that reality. As a spiritual experience, humility contains its own unique paradox. Those possessed by it do not realize that they do participate in it, and those who think they possess it most often have no idea what it is. As the Sufi saying suggests, a saint is a saint unless he knows that he is one. One day a rabbi, in a frenzy of religious passion, rushed in before the ark, fell to his knees, and started beating his breast, crying, I'm nobody! I'm nobody! The cantor of the synagogue, impressed by this example of spiritual humility, joined the rabbi on his knees, saying, I'm nobody! I'm nobody! The shamus custodian, watching from the corner, couldn't restrain himself either. He joined the other two on his knees, calling out, I'm nobody! I'm nobody! At which point the rabbi, nudging the cantor with his elbow, pointed at the custodian and said, Look who thinks he's nobody! Humility is, above all, honesty. True humility and neither exaggerates nor minimizes, but accepts. As Dog Hammerschild put it in markings, humility is just as much the opposite of self-abasement as it is of self-exaltation. To be humble is not to make comparisons. Secure in its reality the self is neither better nor worse, bigger nor smaller than anything else in the universe. It is, is nothing, yet at the same time, one with everything. Tolerance. The way our worthy alcoholics have sometimes tried to judge the less worthy is, as we look back on it, rather comical. Imagine, if you can, one alcoholic judging another. Bill Wilson. Innocently unaware of the prejudices held against him, an old black man, staunchly religious, some years ago applied for membership in an exclusive church. The pastor attempted to put him off with all sorts of evasive remarks. The old man, becoming aware that he was not wanted, said finally that he would pray on it, and perhaps the Lord would tell him just what to do. And several days later he returned, Well, asked the minister, Did the Lord send you a message? Yes, sir, he did was the answer. He told me it wasn't any use. He said, I've been trying to get in that same church myself for ten years, and I still can't make it. Honesty gets us sober, Bill Wilson once observed. But tolerance keeps us sober. Such tolerance, AA members know, is not a grudging putting up with but a loving identification with the tolerance that is the antechamber to forgiveness, the tolerance that is the flowering of a spirituality of imperfection. When we accept ourselves in all our weakness, flaws, and failings, we can begin to fulfill an even more challenging responsibility, accepting the weakness, limitations, and mixed-upness of those we love, 
and respect. Then, and only then, it seems, do we become able to accept the weakness, defects, and shortcomings of those we find it difficult to love. Learning how to live with other human beings is one of the grand classic problems of human being. Most of us tolerate each other by identifying with and seeking out those with whom we share strengths. Most of the time we ignore or avoid those whose strong points are not ours. Thus, when we join groups, we usually do so on the basis of shared strengths. Those who enjoy competing in sports seek out other sports enthusiasts. Professors are most comfortable with other academics. Coin and stamp collectors, automotive buffs, art appreciators, all look for and socialize with those whose interests and skills make possible shared enthusiasms. But Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step groups are founded on a different truth. Human beings connect with each other most healingly, most healthily, not on the basis of common strengths, but in the very reality of their shared weaknesses. Among those who accept their imperfection, there seems to be a special sense of likeness or oneness in their very mutual flawedness. In torn to pieces hood, somehow shared. In such a context of shared weakness, qualities in other people that might, in different circumstances, irritate or anger, instead elicit compassion and identification. Shared weakness, the shared honesty of mutual vulnerability openly acknowledged, that's where we connect. At the most fundamental level of our very humanness, it is our weakness that makes us alike, it is our strengths that make us different. Acknowledging shared weakness thus creates a rooted connectedness, a sense of common beginnings. We will grow in our different directions with our different strengths, but our roots remain in the same soil as everyone else's, the earthly hummus of our own imperfection, forgiveness. The memory of things past is indeed a worm that does not die. Whether it continues to grow by gnawing away at our hearts or is metamorphosed into a brightly colored winged creature depends on whether we can find a forgiveness we cannot bestow on ourselves. Dominic Maruca. Forgiveness is an answer, the divine answer, to the question implied in our existence. An answer is answer only for him who has asked, who is aware of the question. Paul Tillich. A former inmate of a Nazi concentration camp was visiting a friend who had shared the ordeal with him. Have you forgiven the Nazis? He asked his friend, yes. Well, I haven't. I'm still consumed with hatred for them. Well, in that case, said his friend gently, they still have you in prison. The book Alcoholics Anonymous makes an astounding statement. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. Surely, the casual reader thinks, that must be a mistake. Surely it is alcohol that destroys alcoholics. But the big book means what it says, and in the very next sentence explains why. From resentment stem all forms of spiritual disease. Resentment is the poison of the spiritual life. The word means literally feeling again. In the sense of feeling backward, the emphasis is on clinging to the past, a harping on it that becomes mired in it. Resentment goes over and over an old injury, revisiting the hurt, the powerlessness, the rage, the fear, the feeling of being wronged, scraping the scab off the wound. Resentment relishes anew its pain. It is the particular kind of memory that reinforces the vision of self as victim. And this vision is the antithesis of spirituality, for spirituality begins with the recognition of our own imperfection. Focusing on the past faults and failings of others blinds us to the reality of our own present defects and shortcomings. It was this peril, the danger of cutting ourselves off from the spiritual resources that offer the only possible healing of our own imperfection that the desert genius Evagrius Ponticus cautioned against in explaining the proper use of anger 
Evagrius noted that resentment, clinging to misdirected anger, stifled spiritual life by stealing the very tools of virtue. We need to reclaim anger for its proper purpose. It is always a waste of good anger to get annoyed with other human beings. What the ascetic needs to do is to focus his attention on the fact that he is annoyed. Instead of seeing some other human being angrily, he tries to see his own anger. He can then begin to fight against it. Anger can be an important part of the process, the journey that is the construction and discovery of our spiritual home. But resentment has the capacity to stop that process, to abort that journey. The anger that metamorphoses into resentment isolates us, creating the illusion that the world has stopped in its tracks and has come to focus entirely upon our hurts, our desires, our victimhood. In resentment, there is no chance of release, but only imprisonment in a painful past and the gradual stifling of all that serenity, indeed, of all humanity. If a man removes his bitterness, he becomes human. Otherwise, he becomes an animal, observed one Sufi teacher. Resentment unites anger, fear, and sadness in a kind of closed circle, scissors, paper, rock game. In the absence of resentment, anger, fear, and sadness tend to heal each other. Anger can act like a scissors, cutting through fear. The fear that, like an enveloping shroud, wraps itself around and threatens to smother the rock. That is sadness. But that very sadness which rises from the realization of our own transience and the ultimate futility of our own human efforts to control is the only tool we have to blunt anger, to forestall the resentment that anger becomes if it is nourished even after our fears have been quelled. Anger and sadness butt against each other, steel against stone, but just as scissors take paper and rock, takes scissors. Sadness will finally take anger if we let that sadness through. For sadness shared can heal. Anger storms in the hard passage between fear and sadness. Cultivated, it turns into a jagged resentment that tears rather than trims, and that resists healing. Denying fear and scorning the sadness that is shared, resentment refuses the possibility of going through and beyond anger into forgiveness. The danger of anger, the reason why the wrath that is Evagrius' ira has been classically listed as sinful, lies not in anger itself, but in resentment, the clinging to and prolonged attachment to anger. Resentment is this refusal out of fear to cross the bridge of sadness and let ourselves back into the impermanent world of relationship. Anger as resentment refuses relationship, slashing at everything and everyone that comes close. But our pain can be healed only by some kind of closeness, some kind of connection, with others. Sadness opens us to the need for unity and community. The mistake we make is to turn upon our past with angry wholesale negation. The way of wisdom is to treat it airily, lightly, wantonly, and in a spirit of poetry, and above all to use its symbols which are its spiritual essence, giving them a new connotation, a fresh meaning. John Cowper Powies. It is difficult to be a saint in the midst of one's family. Anatole France. A boy with a rare disease had to live his entire life in a sterile plastic bubble for a single germ. An unsterilized touch could be fatal. Anyone reaching to him through the hermetically sealed opening in the bubble had to wear sterilized gloves, and everything that came to him, books, food, utensils, gifts, had to be decontaminated before passing through that opening. He was sealed off, isolated, in permanent quarantine, but even the airtight, sterile bubble couldn't save him. When the boy understood that he was dying, he asked for only one thing, 
to reach outside the bubble and touch his father. Doomed, knowing that this encounter was death itself, the boy reached out and touched his father's hand. The boy in the bubble can serve as a metaphor for us all. Suffering begins in the bubble that is our family, our first home. Touching each other brings pain and even involves danger, the risk of being wounded by someone we love. But life is sterile, lonely, and not worth living in the kind of bubble that precludes touch. For that touching, even if it hurts, is life itself. Our pain and sorrow begin at the very beginning when we begin within our own family. Family contains its own paradox, serving on the one hand as shield and protection against newborn vulnerability, and on the other hand as the setting within which we suffer our first wounds. As infants, we are dependent upon our parents to defend and shelter us, and yet it is inevitably also our parents who first wound us. Given our prolonged physical immaturity and the complex dangers of our modern world, those who love us must forbid no as often as they affirm yes. Soon enough, we are also confronted with the sad but undeniable fact that our parents are imperfect beings who make mistakes. They are not God. We discover that we have been born into a kind of paradoxical 4-H club. If I get close enough to hug someone, then I am close enough also to be hugged by that person. But I am also close enough to be hit. Or to hit. Even if, as often happens, the blow is accidental. In a less physical image of the same 4-H's, if I let people close enough to heal me, then they are also close enough for me to heal them. But in coming that close, we can not only heal, but we can also hurt each other. Again, perhaps unintentionally. The four H's understood either way, the more physical image of hugging and being hugged, hitting and being hit, or the more abstract conception of healing and hurting, being hurt and being healed, are present in every relationship, including, and perhaps most important, family. It is, after all, within our families that we learn relationship. Perhaps that's why the ultimate act of maturity is presented in both literature and psychology as the forgiveness of one's forebears. Yet if we are to believe the pop therapy literature that has become epidemic in modern American culture, the issue is not forgiveness, but the need to free ourselves from our familial past, to find release from our parents' chains. Growing up is presented as a process of looking to the past in order to finger forebears who should have loved us more, protected us more, praised us more, given us more. We are encouraged to think of ourselves as victims, victims of our own families. According to this literature, which lines the shelves in bookstores like different brands of aspirin in a drugstore, as Wendy Kaminer put it in her New York Times analysis of the new disease of codependence, all our unhappiness begins at home, in the family. There, in our first home, we are inevitably subjected to a varying range of physical and emotional abuse, resulting in injury and insult to our inner child, that innocent and pure, even divine entity that exists within us all. The goal of adulthood and recovery, we are told, is to heal that inner child, to recover the innocence and purity of our original self, the identity that existed before our parents got their hands on it. Molding, mangling, twisting, deforming. Because our families are, almost by definition, dysfunctional. We, too, become dysfunctional, adopting types and roles instead of forming our own unique integrated identities. And so instead of truly actualized human beings, we become women who love too much, enablers, heroes, mascots, lost children, and a host of other such survival roles. And having been diagnosed as improperly individuated, we cling to these labels for dear life, for they seem the only source of identity available in the modern family. The literature of pop therapy and pop spirituality seems to make the assumption that along with the divine child within us, there is a divine way of interacting with each other, a method free of 
mistakes, flaws, and imperfections. Parents can be taught how to raise their children without wounding the holy child within. Adults whose inner child has been wounded can recover, in recovery their primary pure essence. But for anyone familiar with a long tradition of a spirituality of imperfection, this worldview is inherently flawed. As John Garvey noted in his study of the prematurely saved, when St. Anthony went into the desert to face himself and God, he did not find in himself a poor self-image. He found demons. The presentation of good health and evil, sickness and addiction, as polar opposites, absolutely black and absolutely white, ignores the fundamental truth, the basic significant reality of the human being. We are inherently and intrinsically imperfect, and therefore any relationship we enter into, voluntarily or involuntarily, familial or otherwise, will necessarily be flawed. A passage often referred to as the promises appears of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, shortly after the reminder that spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it, because so much of this book has been inspired by AA spirituality. It seems fitting to conclude with that paragraph, for we believe that it applies to all who seek a spiritual way of life. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. To those promises, we would add, if we learn to accept our imperfection with humor as a reflection of our very humanity, we will experience humility and tolerance. We will understand that we are already filled with forgiveness. We will see the gift of our lives. The chains will fall away and we will be free. Free not so much from fear or dependence, but free for love, for life itself.